Most of them came from within a mile of this room. Do beetles have souls, Reverend Darwin? Not the ones who live in Christian countries, anyway. But some of them have some very nasty habits. You see this fellow here? Mm -hmm. I peeled some bark off a tree, and he was underneath. So I picked him up like so. Then I saw another one I wanted. So I picked him up as well. But then I saw a third, an even rarer specimen, which I couldn't bear to lose. So I popped this one into my mouth in order to pick up the third, upon which it ejected some frightful fluid inside my mouth, which burnt my tongue. So I spat it out. And in going to wipe my mouth with my hand, this one escaped. <laughs> you mean that wretched little chap's all you've got to show for a day's beetle hunting? A disappointing bag. It's quite rare, actually. So there were all these beetles, going about their business, hurting nobody. Now look at them, pinned up in rows with unpronounceable Latin names. That's what my sister says. She thinks I should only collect the ones that are dead already. Mm. Quite right. I make it a strict rule to only ever go to the lectures of dead professors. Their minds are young, Herbert. Their minds are young. And during my first summer term, my friend Fox persuaded me to accompany him to the botanical gardens, a circumstance which was to influence my whole career. We were to hear a lecture and by a Professor do, Henslow. I have looked out a specimen of Nepenthes, commonly known as the pitcher plant from Malaya. Now, the color of this plant and the smell of the honey it contains attracts insects, which on reaching the slippery lower part of the mouth, fall into the water contained in the bottom and drown. It's difficult, isn't it, not to think of these plants as animate beings, capable of setting traps for other creatures, perhaps as beings more intelligent than their victims. And yet, there they are, growing in the earth just like any common crocus or daffodil. Next week, I shall move on to consider the cacti and other plants which survive in desert regions without the help of the English watering can. Finally, I want to thank all of you who let me see their collection of flora. We undoubtedly have some very talented amateur naturalists in this city. Professor Henslow, May I introduce my friend Charles Darwin? I think you know my brother. Ah, oh, yes, from Shrewsbury. That's right. Are you studying the natural sciences? Only in my spare time, I'm afraid. My course is theology. Well, the two are not incompatible, as you see. I'm walking back to John's. Is that on your way? Yes, indeed. Good. I'll uh, see you tomorrow, Charles. Tomorrow? The shoot. Ah. Oh. Every week I take a coachload of my, shall we say, more exuberant students on a collecting trip. Perhaps you should join us, Mr. Darwin, if it would appeal. I should like to. Yes, I should like to very much. Good. To this day, I don't know why he should have taken to me. In my own eyes, I was more or less indistinguishable from all the other undergraduates. Soon it became our habit to go out almost every day and I became known by dons and undergraduates alike as the man who walks with Henslow. Me, sir, they think they're being fattened up for the pot. <laughs> well, perhaps these will help. Lend a hand, Bennett. Mm. Sir. I have the honor of reporting to you that there are now 
On board His Majesty's surveying vessel, under my command, three natives of Tierra del Fuego. Their names and estimated ages are York Minster, aged about 23, Fuegia Basket, a female, aged about 15, and Jemmy Button, aged about 18. I am maintaining them entirely at my own expense. I hope you will consider the possibility, on our return to England, of some public <laughs> advantage being derived from this circumstance. How much do you think they understand? Very little, I fear, sir. Jimmy seems the brightest. Possibly he comes from a different tribe. Has the girl caused many problems? Even if we had ladies' quarters, there'd still be problems. But she doesn't seem to need too much privacy. I warn the men I won't tolerate any interference. I will, sir. I think that Jemmy might benefit from a spell in my cabin before we reach Plymouth. I shall teach him some English. As you wish, sir. During the latter half of my time at Cambridge, I became more and more friendly with Professor Henslow. Throughout my life, I have seldom met a man who was quite so free from any tinge of vanity or other petty feeling. He was deeply religious and thought little of himself or his own concerns. He told me once he would be grieved if a single word of the 39 articles were to be altered. In later years, I fear I must have disappointed him greatly. I suppose no one would say he possessed much original genius. But he had one great quality which influenced all my scientific work. And that was his habit of drawing conclusions from long, continued and minute observations. How many different species of beetles did you say there are? Oh, about a quarter of a million or so. That we know of. Why? It's enough to make a man think. A great many beetles indeed. If you were creator of the universe, would you go to the trouble of creating 250,000 different species of beetles? Really, Darwin? There's no evidence the Lord our God is a lazy God. I think I would say that a world of infinite variety makes me believe more, not less, in the miracle of creation. I suppose so, yes. Oh, I think I have something. Look! It's a wasp beetle. Now, you couldn't wish for a more beautiful example of a creature adapted to its environment. Predators are frightened off by its colours, but actually it's quite harmless. It has no sting. Why should the Almighty choose to make a beetle which survives by looking like a wasp, and another quarter of a million which survive by entirely different means? Well, why not? If our Lord can make something as complex as a man, why should a few thousand varieties of beetle present him with any difficulty? Hmm. I'm beginning to think that your enthusiasm for natural science is a good deal stronger than your enthusiasm for theology. Well, you're the one who must take the blame for that. Anyway, you seem to manage to combine the two very happily. Why shouldn't I? Well, I suggest you put them both out of your mind and concentrate on navigating this punt. Right. 